Well, I thought it, I would, thought, I thought it would tell me it was recording to the cloud. Um, thank you very much, Marcus. Oh, there's the state. You're on. There's the statement going up on Larry. So we got it made. To do something on radio sons. Who knows what a radio sound is? Ah, cool. The uh, the nifty thing is you're going to learn a whole lot more about it and how you can get one for your very own, and it becomes an addiction like these two guys have done. Um, Bob and Rick, isn't there a morning show guys like that? No, Bob and Tom. The Bob and Tom. That's right. Bob and Rick are the two that are chasing these uh, locally. Bob started out uh, probably three or four months ago. Said, do you think this is cool? And then Rick got involved, and he's an addict. And uh, there isn't there isn't Radio Sons Anonymous, right? <laughs> I don't think. Well, Ed's working on a thirteen step program. <laughs> we'll get him a thirteen step program. So hopefully, one or two of you will get addicted as well and and have fun with them. Both of these guys are local hams. Both of them have done a lot of stuff. Uh, Bob's just in from Tulsa. He just moved to the local area. Rick's been here since he was a little guy, and. Uh, it was his fourth time licensed third time li four i think yeah four he gets he gets new licenses every while once in a while but he's currently ai5 ij so i'm going to introduce to you bob and rick and i don't know who starts this thing off rick, i started up bob does so bob enjoy the day okay uh, thank you much all right well thank you much for inviting us in uh it was an interesting deal uh like you said we just moved over from tulsa a few months ago and I went to Willie CMC. Oh, okay. Can you see me? <laughs> oh, there's the camera. Okay. So um, just moved a few months ago, and I had been hearing about the weather balloons that get launched here out of Norman all the time. And so I went to Elmer Knight and I said, Who's the expert on the weather balloons? And the message I got was, Bob, when you figure it out, you can make a presentation. So, so here we are today. And I also uh, got Rick interested in it, and he's just taken off like wildfire. So it's, it's been a, a fun time for us. So, um, I, I'm, yeah, if you don't mind, I've got Rick over here. I'm going to start it out today, and then uh, I've just got some static slides. And then part of the way through, I'm going to turn it over to Rick. He's going to have some live demos of some of the materials, and uh, uh, he's also going to correct all the mistakes I've made in the first part of the presentation. <laughs> and then I'll, I've got a couple of slides at the very end. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, start through the list of topics there. We're going to talk about what is a radio song, why would a ham be interested in radio songs, what's the minimum I need to track, what info can I get if I'm tracking them, what do I need to chase uh, and or recover that's different than tracking? And then what can I do if I'm able to recover a radio song? So next slide there for us. <clears throat> so what's a radio song? Well, it's a high altitude balloon and it has a sensor package attached. And the sensors can have a GPS. Typically they have GPS temperature and humidity or the ones that get sent from Norman here. And then occasionally they'll do one that has a pressure sensor in it as well. Um, they routinely launch uh, twice a day here out of Norman, 6 a.m. and 6 p.m., 365. It's a like clockwork kind of a deal. They transmit using a protocol called Horus, which was described as a four uh, frequency shift keying kind of a protocol. Uh, here in Norman, they typically broadcast on uh, 404.2 megahertz, but it'll be somewhere in the range of 400 to 406. Is uh, If you're travel anywhere in the U.S., it'll typically be somewhere in that band. They, uh, the balloons typically go up uh, to about 115,000 feet. That's 22 miles or 33 kilometers for guys like Rick over here. <laughs> and uh, uh, it, when it pops, then they drift back down. They, there's a little small parachute. I've got an example over here in the box if somebody wants to see it afterwards. The flight lasts up to two to three and a half hours, depending on the winds and how far up it goes and, and so on. The landing point varies dramatically. Uh, I've just been 
kind of monitoring this off and on over the last few months. And I've seen it go as far east, land as far east as near McAllister and as far west as near Lawton. And so if you decide you're gonna chase one, you might wanna check and see where is it gonna land first? Because you might have a 15 minute drive, you might have a two hour drive each way. And so it's handy to know uh, roughly where it's gonna land. The uh, National Weather Service suggests that you recycle or dispose of them properly. Uh, back in the day, they used to have a little mail bag that was attached to it, and they wanted you to mail it back to them. And for whatever reason, they've decided they don't want you to do that anymore, which is good for us because that means we get to pick them up for free. Uh, next slide there, Rick, for me. This is a typical balloon house, they call it, uh, that they launched them from. Rick's got a really nice video from the, uh, the new place they launched from down at the OU campus. Uh, if you notice about a quarter mile from here, there's an old building that looks just like this. And that's where they launched them for, for many, many years. There's about 160 to 180 locations here in the US that they launch balloons from. Uh, it's not just a U.S. deal. They launched these balloons from all around the world. Um, we have one launch point in Oklahoma, Norman. Uh, Texas has three. So you can kind of get a sense for how things get spread out across the, uh, the U.S. for the launch points. Next slide. This has nothing to do with our radio song, but it shows what happens when a balloon pops at 22 miles up. And uh, you get a sense that it looks really cold up there. And that's because it's typically about minus 70 degrees C uh, at that altitude. And uh, I just thought this was a neat picture. Um, and it's, it's an example of what the uh, radio sign could see if it had eyes. <laughs> okay, next slide shows what these look like. We've got some examples here, and I think Rick is going to pass one of these little styrofoam containers around. Uh, on there, it says, this is a harmless weather device. Uh, please dispose of properly. This one has a special message. Yeah, too. And, and they have handwritten notes on them. Uh, the, the couple that I have have the date and Norman, Oklahoma written on them. This one has a special note to somebody's best friend forever, we'll say. <laughs> okay, next slide shows the inside of one of these radiosons. Uh, by the way, this is the RS-41NG. There's a real common one here in the U.S. And so you can uh, get a sense for what, what it looks like. And uh, uh, Rick will talk about some of the details of these in a little bit more detail here in just a bit. Next slide shows what the signal looks like. That waterfall down the right-hand side, uh, this is a, out of a software program called SDR Sharp with a uh, uh, software-defined dongle uh, doing the decoding of the signal. And so you can see it's a continuous kind of a cycle. It's not on for a little bit and off for a little bit. Uh, like I said, it's a four FSK protocol and it's described as more effective than APRS. How many have used APRS for some of their activities? Okay, we'll talk a little bit more about APRS here in just a bit. This is uh, described as giving a further distance than APRS and also more reliable in the signal. Okay, next slide. Why would a ham be interested? Well, several reasons. The for one, it's a possible gateway into high altitude ballooning or pico ballooning. And as I understand it, the differences between those two is these radio sounds are typically used by the National Weather Service for high altitude ballooning. They've got a small device on their sensor package, uh, small batteries, last for a few hours. It goes up, the balloon pops, and it's recording information about temperature, pressure, humidity, and so on and its location, and, and uh, as it comes back down, it's a few hours. Pico ballooning, on the other hand, is instead of having batteries, you have a uh, couple of small solar panels, and 
a, instead of batteries, a couple of super capacitors. And so uh, you'll launch these things and they may cruise along at 40,000, 50,000 feet. They collect uh, energy from the solar panel, drive a little small 20 watt milliamp uh, or milliwatt radio that's an HF kind of a radio using Whisper as a protocol, transmit ever, once every 20 minutes or so, go silent while it's in the dark and then start back up again next time it's in the sunlight. So some of those can go around the globe multiple times. And so it's a totally different deal, but it's somewhat related in, in uh, people's mindsets. And, and it also they... gives you an opportunity to practice a pox scent because you've got something that you can trace. It's a UHF signal. And so you can use a directional antenna and follow around with that if you'd like and learn how to uh, attenuate the signal so that uh, you still have directionality, even though you might be uh, in a situation where it's a fairly strong signal as you get closer to it. So kind of a fun way to practice that. You can also learn about how to feed, how this data feeds into the weather prediction. And most of us talk about the weather once or twice a, a day or a week or a month. And so, so this is uh, sort of the front end of the whole process of collecting information about the winds and the temperatures and the humidities at different levels and how that feeds into the weather prediction models. And it's kind of neat that we're here in Norman. They, there's a huge National Weather Center down at the OU campus. I, I've not been inside there, but I took the virtual tour the other day. They've got some really neat stuff there. So hopefully a lot of you guys have already been through that and looked it over. Uh, it's also a great way to help your kids and grandkids with possible school, science, technology, uh, engineering, and math kind of projects, and really on multiple fronts. So there's the weather aspect, there's also a radio element to it, of course, and also computers, because there's a lot of decoding of that signal that, that comes into play. So, you know, you could help kids in any one of those areas to get a good grade in science class. Uh, if it's retrieved, you can reprogram them with uh, ham radio frequencies and relaunch them, or you can just use them as a GPS tracker, for instance. It's got a serial port on there. And since it's got a GPS device uh, receiver on there, it spits out the uh, signal out of that on the serial port. So if you wanted to, you could track your 16 year old when he says, I wanna borrow the car. Uh, <laughs> and you say, yeah, come straight home. Well, guess what? You can uh, check him later and see how he did. Uh, you can also use it as a mini weather station because it does send out temperature and pressure uh, on a very quick basis, or you could use it as the fox in a fox and hound kind of a deal. And next slide is free. So <laughs> uh, now you do have to, Rick can tell you about fuel charges uh, to go chase these things all over the country. Uh, and you may have a, a emergency room charge for a snake bite or poison ivy or something like that, because they come down in all kinds of places. Again, Rick will talk about that here in just a bit. Okay, so uh, what do we get for free? Well, this package contains a really nice, uh, powerful, but uh, energy efficient STM32 CPU. It has 24 megahertz clock, so it's pretty quick. And it has 64 K bytes of flash, so you can put quite a bit of program programming in it. It has a U-Blox, uh, which is a well-known brand GPS receiver. This is about two generations back, but it's a really good one. Uh, I've seen typically uh, on the launches around here locally that they'll have uh, 10 or so satellites that it's picking up at any given time. And that's more than enough to, to have a nice accurate signal. Uh, it also has a transmitter that's a little Silicon Labs uh, 4032. It puts out about 60 milliwatts, which may not sound like much until you realize that these things can be heard a long ways away. So uh, when I first started watching these things here locally, I noticed that there was a guy up north of Tulsa, Owasso, which is over hundred miles from here. And he was routinely tracking these things and feeding that signal back into 
a thing called uh, Sondhub. And so very low power, but line of sight does wonders. Okay, uh, next slide. What do we uh, need? What's the minimum you would need to track? Um, the minimum is stuff you already have, likely. A PC or a smart device like a phone or a tablet with a browser and a connection to the internet. And uh, if you go to this location, sondhub.org, and scroll over to the area that you care about, then there'll be uh, a, a uh, icon that you can click on and it'll tell you the details that are being transmitted right then. And so there'll be some examples that uh, we'll do here in just a bit. Uh, next slide. Um, what info do I get while I'm tracking? Well, if you're doing it during the window that it's actually still up in the air, like say two or three hours after, uh, up to two or three hours after 6 a.m. or 6 p.m., you see the, the sond itself on a map. If it's ascending, it looks like a, a balloon. If it's descending, it looks like it's a parachute kind of an icon. You'll see the 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 track that it's already accomplished and a future or predicted track on the sondhub.org site. Uh, you see a little bullseye that shows where they predict it's going to land. That that predicted site varies um, because it updates the projection as the flight is in progress. So you'll see it move around some. It could be it could move several miles, five miles, ten miles over the course of the uh, the flight. You can also see all the other radio sounds that are in the air in progress. And uh, if people choose to, they can turn on a switch and some of the software we'll talk about, and you can actually see where their chase cars are relative to the sounds themselves. Otherwise, you can look at the historical data from past flights. And now I'm going to just skip over some maps because Rick's going to talk about all these things here in just a little bit. I put them in the slide set just in case somebody wanted to review the slides at a later date. The, the information will all be there together. Okay, so what's needed to track the device or chase it? Well, we talked already about if you just want to track it and sit at home or uh, carry your phone or tablet with you, you can use that sound hub. Here's a couple of other options. Uh, one is a Raspberry Pi based system and the other one is a little microcontroller development board called a Lilygo T-Beam STM32. And the name of it continues on with a bunch of other things. <laughs> So the, the name of it is longer than it would take you to order it from Amazon, but it's a, it's a very powerful device. We've got some examples here and Rick's going to show you um, um, some of those live as well. So uh, the next slide is with the Raspberry Pi, here are the items that you would typically use. And I've got one in a, uh, the whole kit and caboodle over in this little small tub over here. And so you can see it doesn't take up a whole lot of space. We're talking about a thing about this big. So Raspberry Pi three or four, uh, they are starting to be in a little bit better supply for a while they were unobtainium. Uh, about six months ago, I actually bought one through Mouser and they showed it as backordered, but I had read that uh, they're really good about fulfilling their back orders. So I went ahead, ordered one. I ordered the eight gigabyte one for $75. That's the list price, which is really unusual. And uh, they instantly charged my credit card, which was not great. But two weeks later, I had the thing in the mail. So if you're not in a hurry, that's a good way to go and you know get a decent price at it. You also need a, a RTL SDR. And I I guess I could hold these up here. Let me do this. So I, I don't know if this shows up very well on the camera. Can you see that? So this little guy right here is a uh, software-defined radio dongle. 
between between my fingers here, about 35 bucks. And here's a Raspberry Pi with, with a case that's about 10 bucks. Here's a keyboard that goes with this thing. Here's a little 12 volt driven monitor. <laughs> and then I've got a, one other thing to show you is a little dongle that's on the list there. Um, you don't really need this unless you're wanting to chase it and have your information about your location sent back to Sondhub so that other people can see where you are relative to the rest of the world. So again, fits in a small, relatively small package. Thanks, Mark. You wouldn't miss it if something went wrong, right? <laughs> Not for long. <laughs> um, of course, there's a battery in there if you want to run mobile. Um, and there was an optional thing on there. There was a couple other things attached to the SDR dongle. One was a low, low noise amplifier and it's a little small box about that big and a 403 megahertz filter. For a long time, I didn't have those two things and I was able to track just fine. Okay, next slide. Now, of course, since it's a Raspberry Pi, you need some uh, software to load on there. So here's a couple of links uh, to some software packages that allow you to track the thing. And then the Chase Mapper one, the second one on the list there, uh, lets you um, log where your vehicle is. And that's what sends your location with that GPS dongle that I had up a minute ago back to Sondhub. And so then, then you can see uh, other people can see where you are, which is kind of handy. If if you decide I'm going to go chase something and you see that Rick is already out there, for instance, then you may or may not want to take the time to gather up all your stuff and go. Uh, the next part of this is about... Or you could just go help him pull it out of the tree. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And and he'll he'll have a pole or two for you to get things out of trees. Uh, the next part here is uh, this software also allows you to, it creates a little web server inside the Raspberry Pi. And so you don't need to have internet connection to be able to start up these two locations, the local host with 5,000 as the um, port, and then 5,001 if you want to see your, your car location, your chase vehicle location. So again, that's kind of handy. If you're out in the boonies and don't have a, a good solid internet signal, this is a good way to go. Okay, next slide. This is uh, my road crew that went with me to pick up one of the radio songs. That's my granddaughter, Millie. And she's got a larger tub of stuff that I can now fit into a smaller tub. And we uh, ended up picking up one of the radio songs I got over here on the table over by Slaughterville, uh, over by Purcell. And uh, it landed out in a nice open field. It was easy to get to. That's the landowner. We, uh, we narrowed it down to a one mile square area, pulled in there and, and happened to talk to Mr. Luke and told him what, what we were chasing. I showed him my screen from my Raspberry Pi and I asked him if this was his land. And he said, yes, but I was just up there this morning and I didn't see anything. And I said, well, it landed in the last 10 minutes. And he says, oh, really? Yeah, let's go. And so, you know, he was, he was excited as we were about it. And so we went up there. He helped us, helped Millie get through the, the barbed wire, walked 100 feet, gathered up all the stuff. And uh, uh, he was real interested in it. He also told us that, he gets three or four of these on his property a year. And he says, this is just trash to me. You know, I hate it because my cows chew these things up. Right. And uh, so I said, well, from now on, when you get one, here's my phone number. So, so, you know, if you know anybody, yeah, if you know anybody that's got some land, you know, tell them, hey, if you see these things, give me a call. Because otherwise it says right on there, dispose of properly. And people read that as, pitch it in the trash. So anyhow, 
that's, that's kind of a neat thing. Okay, so you saw the first option there was, you know, something this big, and you got to put the dongle up on the dashboard, and you have an antenna that you hook it up to, typically a uh, mag mount antenna up on top. The second option is this little guy right here. Okay. This is that thing with a real long name. There, there's the full name there, LORA V1.1, ESP32, 433, blah, blah, blah. But it's $35. And you can attach a little uh, 16 or 18650 lithium battery on the back, or it's got a connector here on, so you can just hook in a uh, iPhone charger, something like that, and run it off from one of those little battery packs. And guess what? This is a great little device. It, you have to uh, to get a decent antenna. You'd want to put a real antenna on here, but a HD type antenna would be more than sufficient. Here's the GPS antenna right there. So this thing is got. Um, yes, sir. That GPS antenna that you see there is one that I added after I broke the one that comes on it. There's one that's a little bit nicer that comes on it. Yeah, so here's mine. You, that little brown thing on the very back. <laughs> Not yet, but but to be fair, it is loose and it keeps, you know, it's just stuck on with cheap Chinese glue, and so it keeps coming loose. Completely red. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So in fact, I'll pass this around and let you guys take a look at it. Thank you, Rick. So it's got a UHF receiver, it's got Wi-Fi built into it, it's got a GPS receiver, it's got a little small display, all that's $35. Now the tricky part is they're not always in stock at Amazon. Uh, and for good reason, because you can see there's a boatload of stuff in there that they do. So it's got a, it, uh, with the software that you load in for chasing songs, it's got the ability to put up a little web server. And so, you know, you attach your phone or whatever to the uh, uh, access point, the Wi-Fi access point, and then you can uh, control and set up different things. Uh, Rick's gonna talk more about that. So I'll, I'll uh, keep moving on that. So the next slide, just a picture of what's going around the room. But for those of you on Zoom, that's what it looks like. Yeah, Rick will talk a little bit about that. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so here's a comparison of the two options that, that uh, we've explored. The uh, Raspberry Pi-based solution on the, on the side, you, know, you need to know a little bit about Unix. Some people here in the room, you're comfortable with that. Others run, you know. <laughs> uh, but you may have, most of the pieces already. I had a lot of this stuff already because I've got a, uh, a system that I use for field day and I just had a bunch of that stuff already. Um, what's nice about the Raspberry Pi based version is it scans that entire band from 400 to 406 uh, when, it, when you first start it up and it looks for the strongest signal. And when it sees a strong signal, it latches onto that. And so you don't have to go program anything into it for it to pick up a strong signal. When that strong signal goes away, it goes back into scan mode looking again. And it, you know, it'll go for until your battery dies or until 12 hours later when the next local one goes back up. Uh, it puts the map uh, maps up on a HDMI monitor, the little one like that, or a big one if you've got it hooked up at home. Uh, and it's really good as a base station or a, even a mobile station. The little T-beam unit, easy to install the firmware. It's easy to use, not a whole lot of pieces to it, small physically. Drawback is that you have to predefine the, the uh, frequencies via the web server. It's not hard. It, it's just a, a little bit of a drawback. Um, but overall, it is a great solution for chasing. So if you're just wanting to go out, chase a balloon, not just set it home and track it, then that's really a good one to, to look at. 
Okay, next slide. Here, there's a few other options to track that we didn't pursue. One is a Windows-based version of some software called RS41 Tracker. Uh, you'd have to install a what's called a Zadig Windows driver. Um, not hard, it's just something you have to do. Uh, and it uses the SDR dongle and the GPS dongles like test it, but uh, uh, that's certainly an option. And then the other option is an, an, a little LilyGo smaller board that doesn't have a GPS receiver on it. It's about two thirds the length of the one I'm passing around. I've got a, a, an example of it over here on the table. It's $5 cheaper. And sometimes it's a good solution if the other is just unavailable. Um, so, so that's an option as well. Okay, next slide. So one option of things that you can do with these recovered SONs is uh, recycle it with an APRS protocol on a ham 70 centimeter frequency. So there's software out there, you know, these things uh, have been around for a number of years and they're used all around the world. And so people have developed brand new firmware that you can squirt into these things. Uh, you do need a little $15 dongle. Let me show you what that looks like. little $15 dongle that connects between the interface on the back of the, the SON and the USB port on your computer. And so that allows you to, to squirt that firmware into the radio SON. I've got one setting over here on the table that I've converted over to uh, APRS on 432.5. And those of you that know what, AX25 sounds like, that's what it is. The difference is this is on UHF. It's on UHF, not VHF. Most people think of VHF, of APRS is on 144.390 here in the US. <clears throat> that's a common frequency, but it's not a required frequency. So you can put it on any uh, appropriate hand pre ham frequency if you want to. Uh, for those that are on the uh, Zoom call, go ahead and go to the next slide there, Rick. There's there's that radio on that frequency there. You can see the text on there. It says RS41 radio son firmware test in the message that it transmitted to my handy talkie. And then there's a little icon with the balloon on it in the, the rightmost picture. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a cute little setup. Now, the way you would monitor that, of course, is to just use your standard HD radio that has APRS capability. It wouldn't by itself go out into the APRS.fi uh, world. Okay, second option there is to uh, recycle it and, and poke in some uh, new receiver frequencies into the existing firmware that came from the manufacturer. Uh, and so there, somebody has developed some techniques to do that. You do need to obtain a registration from the Horus group, and then you would attach a, uh, a little uh, microcontroller. Here's a little microcontroller that pokes the uh, new values for the frequency you want to use into the firmware that's existing in there already. Um, and it has, to, it has to be inserted in there every time it gets powered up. And so that's what this setup does. And it's described out on the internet. People have developed the firmware to make, make it happen. So it's kind of a slick way to do that. Um, so you would put your own call sign in there. That's an easy thing to do attach it to a new balloon, relaunch it, and track it on a, a slightly different website. Instead of sondhub.org, it's amateur.sondhub.org. Uh, I don't know if Rick, if you're gonna talk about that, but there's, there's the example of the map that it looks like. 
And so you can see there's there's several other amateurs out there floating balloons on the day that I snapped that picture. Okay, uh, more options. The third option would be to use it as a hardwired GPS tracker. You can attach to the serial port on the bottom of the, or the back of the, the radio sign. It's just a standard format that all GPS units use. It's called the uh, NMEA, the National Marine Electronics Association protocol. Simple, standard kind of thing. And it can also send out uh, uh, weather kind of information over the serial port for temperature and humidity. So there, number four, you could use it as a mini weather station, or you could use it as a fox in the fox hunt. You can actually, with the firmware, like I've put on there for APRS, one of the options is to put in a CW or have it output a CW signal with a call sign that you define. So it could be a club call sign, it could be an individual call sign in CW. So it'd be a nice little fox device on that. Okay, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Rick now. He's gonna do some live demos and fix all the problems I screwed up. <laughs> and uh, hopefully talk about some of the challenges of recovery in radio songs. Okay, Rick, turn it, I, turn it on there. I don't remember hearing any mistakes, Bob, so. <laughs> Good answer. Okay, so one hot day I went over to the National Weather Center and um, recorded this. So this is actually um, a weather service balloon launch that you could go watch twice a day. Um, and this will give you an idea of what it looks like before we go chasing them. It looks like the cameraman had been drinking a little bit too much. Or not, didn't have enough. Yeah. So my understanding is that they fill these things with hydrogen and or helium. Um, I don't know which this is. Hydrogen's here. Hyd we use hydrogen. Yeah. And so there they go. And you can see that there's a parachute underneath the balloon, and then at the very bottom is the radio sonde um, that we've been talking about. I want to watch that again. Okay, so this is a a picture of the the live display that you get from from what Bob's handing around. So I guess I don't need to show this because most of you saw that already. Well, it's just scanning the one I handed the, out. Oh, okay. So this is a it changes once it's detected um, a radio sound on its frequency, then it changes to this display, which actually shows the location and um, the signal strength. And I don't know if you can see my mouse, but that little row of tick marks, each one of those tick marks indicates a successful uh, reception of the most recent packet that was sent. Um, from the radio son. Um, and these are some slides from my first uh, first actual recovery. Um, I had I had chased one before, but um, my first chase, I thought that I could find it using conventional, RF direction finding techniques and and I I found that it was quite difficult and I didn't bring enough equipment with me so I didn't get the first one I actually chased but this one um, somewhere west of Purcell um, there were some cows standing nearby that were <laughs> pointing the way to it um, I had to I had to do a little hike to get here. Um, but uh, it, the first thing I saw was, of course, the the white hanging from the tree. And then I got a little closer and you get a little closer and you see the string. And in the one on the right hand side, you can see the radio sound on the ground there. And there's pictures of it. Um, 
finally back at the vehicle. Um, I was the the my phone camera was doing pretty good, and it doesn't show how uh, how past dusk this was. <laughs> Um, I was worried that I was going to get stuck in this uh, in this field without being able to find my way back um, because it was not a it was not a direct route to to get there. But sometimes uh, they land in a little bit more convenient location. This is over on Southeast 12th, just south of Alameda, the Mazios parking lot there. Um, people were turning off of 12th Street and trying to figure out what to do to avoid the orange thing in the middle of the drive there. Um, I don't know if you can see it from here, but um, here, you want me to point out the line. So coming up from the left-hand side uh, the line right there. is where the, the string goes and it, it yeah, actually goes, um, you see those power lines off to the left there? <laughs> um, well, well the, the parachute went on the top side and the radio sound uh, went on the low side. So the radio sound was hanging about 10 feet above the ground um, from the power lines. Oh. Yeah, oh. the utility lines. I, oh. I, no, I, I uh, I lowered it to the ground and from this side and then undid the string and and got this mess out of their way, you know. It was causing a traffic issue. I figure I was I was doing a service for the community. Um and sometimes when you retrieve these things, so so I really took this picture to show you that. On the morning launches, I, I, I've only seen this on the morning launches, although I've never retrieved every launch that I've gone after, so I can't say for sure that they don't put them on the evening launches, but they put a glow stick on the morning launches for some reason, um, and um, that's why I took this picture, but also in this picture, you can see, of course, the orange is the parachute. You can tell the white string and and the other white stuff in the middle is the remnants of the latex balloon. And um, I don't know. You may think I watered it up like that, but I did not. That's the way it came out of the sky. And with Bob's good picture from the first of the presentation, um, where you can see how violent that explosion was, um, there's some uh, pretty interesting dynamics that occur between the balloon explosion and the cords that are hanging down below it. And it almost looks like they're braided together sometimes. Um, okay, so now I was going to see if I can show you some What it looks like when these things are talking to it. So, right now I've got uh, a radio sound that we've recovered hooked up to my computer on a serial port, and you see that it uh, when when I powered it up, it spits out some serial information there. Um, And if you put in a secret code, it will um, bring up a menu for you and you've got some options of, so we're actually talking to the radio sound with the firmware as they launch it um, from the weather service. Um, and you can do some things like if I hit S, it'll give me a readout of what the current sensor um, information is. And you can see relative humidity I don't know what units those are in because it doesn't seem like percent because I don't think it's 125% humidity. Um, <laughs> well, it here. is Oklahoma. Uh, <laughs> I, and, and especially chasing in my car, some, some days it did feel like that. Um, so this is just a sort of an example of, of what you can do um, once you recover them, 
before doing any programming. I haven't done any of the reprogram reprogramming of them. Bob's the the one that has done all of that so far. Um, but you can still do some things um, with them as they are. So you could change the baud rate to whatever you want to um, um, within these options here. Um, I had not connected to this a while in a while last night when I tried to connect to it and I couldn't remember what baud rate I had set it to. So it took me, took me, took me a little bit to get back to that. Um, and there was one more thing that I was going to show you here. Um, well, one of the commands here lets you change the ID that it sends out. So this is where you would put in your club call sign or your individual call. Right. That's the serial number one here. Well, I thought it was. I would do Ken Brown. So do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's the there's the actual serial number of this one that as it was launched. But you could you can put whatever you want in there. You can put. Um, Okay, so there's there's a way to do the GPS, and that's what I was trying to. Maybe it's measurements. Okay, so yeah, if you take the measurements menu, it measurements option, it drops you down into a sub menu where you have other options, and I can hit G for GPS. No, that's not it. In uh, in okay. in for NMEA sentences. Okay, so um, it's. If you if you come up and look at one of these um, at some point, e either today or like on Elmer night, um, you'll see the tiny little GPS antenna it has. So it's not picking up the GPS uh, signals or it hasn't been able to pick them up inside the building here. But if we were outside, it would have picked up the, the satellites and it would be showing you position, um, location. And this is much like many um, GPS uh, receivers that you could plug into your computer. So um, your computer would would use this and 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 could parse it um, as if it were um, a GPS dongle um, without any additional software. That's all. Just that a full location and time. All right? right. You get everything. Get everything that you yeah. normally get. Um, with GPS. What's that? It does not. So to take that a step further, you could use that as a time base for doing FT8 out in the field on field day and not have to worry about, because FT8, you need to have a real accurate time base. And so this would be a solution for that. Yeah, that too. <laughs> would you need a coat? Mm, not for the first four or five minutes. <laughs> All right, if, if I can get this window over here, I will show you. Okay, so this is um, the Sondhub um, website, which tracks, uh, will allow you to track all the balloons all over that are launched all over the world. And um, if you look at this, we'll zoom out in a minute. Um, it, it's just amazing how many balloons there are. Um, but this one is showing the two two launches, one from last night and one from this morning. Um, I can't read that over there. Is this the, is it on the one from, yes, it's one hour and 53 minutes ago. So, so this balloon is the, yes. is the one that was launched this morning. Um, it, the last signal was received. Oh, when it, what, what's the what's the altitude? Five thousand eight hundred and thirty-five meters. Is that what it says? 
Yes. Top, top yes. left. Yes. yes. Okay. So that was the last signal that it uh, that um, and that the guy in Chickasha picked up. So this green line is showing you um, what receiver um, picked it up last. Question is, what time do they launch? About six. A.M. Usually and about six p.m. Yeah, and about, but about it's six about seven about six. The, the weather service's rules is they have to be up by seven o'clock. Yeah, zero Z and twelve. Yeah, yeah. they're but, supposed to be up at zero Z and twelve. There, but, but be up at that point. Yeah, and so they typically launch an hour before zero Z and twelve. But I can tell you that they aren't always on time. Um, right. So looking at this map, um, I'm going to point out, you'll see gray rings on the um, on the Sond Hub map, and those are launch sites. And you'll see green or gold or even silver rings. And these are receivers. Um, like there's a receiver here in Tulsa. There's a receiver in Chickasha. There's a couple of receivers in um, Stillwater. If I click on those, it gives you some more information about it. Like, like this guy's uh, receiver is is one of these, or is something very similar, running the same software. And yeah. this guy's receiver is like the the Raspberry Pi, like like Bob has. Um, so you can get a lot of information from, from going to this website. You could do tracking, um, you could do tracking just using this website, but part of the problem with using this, only this website is that, um, the last reading that it gets may be like like this one, 1,450 meters above, it, oh, it's not 1,450 meters above the ground, it's at 1,450 meters above altitude from the reference, um, from the reference model for the earth. And around here, our typical ground level is about 350 meters. So that's only about 1,100 meters in the air, but that's still a long, long way to fall with an Oklahoma wind. So it, it's uh, it may not be um, very close to this last last seen location, especially on like this one where it's five thousand meters, almost six thousand meters. Um, what you can do though, and what 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 I've done is um, you drive out to the location where it was last picked up. And if you drive out there and have one of these in your car, it'll still the the transmitter will still be transmitting, and so you can pick it up, and it will update the location to where it actually has landed. Um, and it's it's much easier to find them if you know where it's actually landed than if you know where it was five minutes before it hit the ground. We need to put a receiver as a sectoid of the landing zone. We do. We need we need lots of receivers. Um, so one of the things that Bob talked about is that you can get historical information. If you go over here and click on one of the launch sites, um, it brings up the option. It'll generate predictions for future launches, which in my mind is not all that helpful because even when it starts the prediction after the balloon is launched, the, the predicted landing spot is not necessarily anywhere um, near where it actually lands. I Early on when I started chasing these things, um, it had said it was gonna land out by Newcastle. So I drove out to Newcastle and um, the balloon actually landed northeast of Norman, so um, it, it was a, it was a lot of driving for nothing. 
But if you click on the historical <clears throat> button, it'll think a minute. And it'll say, okay, I'm assuming you want this year. What month do you want? And I'm just going to go ahead and leave it for September. Um, but you could pick any month that you wanted and say fetch. And it'll display all the previous landing spots. And, and the darker the ring is, the lower the last detected altitude was. Like this one was detected as low as 383 meters, which is very near um, ground level. Um, this blue one was 1,361 meters, which is not that, not that close to ground level. Um, but you can also, once you've clicked on this, you can click on and say, okay, well, what did that flight path look like? And it'll show you, once it thinks about it a bit, it'll show you the, the flight path that was taken to get to this landing point. Well, do you see anything? It may be hidden by the boxes. I don't know. I, live demos. I, I, I have seen this work before, though. I don't know why it's not working right now. But Rick, on the two you had up there before, they both had a big squiggly line in the middle. Mm -hmm. Is that apogee, or is that when it's going slow? Or when it's... That is the that is the track. That's the path that it flew. Okay, so it just I just wasn't patient enough. Yeah. Um it, it No, it it can be like that at any altitude. Um and it, it, probably over here on the left hand side here is probably where the balloon burst. Um, Right, right. Yeah. Hey, Rick. Yes, sir. Click on the telemetry graph right there. And now, as you as you swipe back and forth across that grid, it'll show you where on the map. Oh, yeah. So the blue line there is altitude, so you can see where it peaks and then it drops a whole lot quicker than it So went. right here is where it burst. It did not make any change. It's, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? Okay, well, we are, um, you guys have any questions? I was watching J vehicles, watching the uh, radio sign, and it was during like three miles, you know, where it was landing. And it just kept moving all over the place. And supposedly it was landed because it didn't, didn't show the parachute anymore. I, I would not always believe the parachute indication. Yeah. Um that it's been my experience. And and, and I really don't believe the predicted landing spot until it gets very close to the end. Um, the uh, the the web interface that the little um, TTGO um, tracker puts up also has a prediction, and I've seen a difference between the Sondhub prediction and that prediction. That's just you know. I, I saw one that was predicted to land um, in Mexico. Um, so it, I'm not sure what algorithm that they use to generate those predictions, but they can vary quite wild, wildly. And it ended up, it, it showed that it was landing at uh, the wildlife management area, mm -hmm. and it actually landed just north of Nova. Interesting. Uh, how how soon after a watch can you be stuck with this? 
Well, since it usually lands while I'm at work, I usually wait till lunchtime. Um, but the other day, I mean, realistically, you know, once it gets to, down to the last, you know, 30 minutes of, of the drop, you could start heading out that way. Um, but if you go an hour ahead of time, yeah, you may be 20 miles off. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, well, and, and the parachute, as you saw from the one wad of the balloons that, that, that I had, And now, now, if you, if you're tracking the balloon, you can you it'll tell you what its rate of descent is. So if it's falling about five meter five or six meters per second, then the parachute's probably working. But I've seen it also fall two or three meters per second, and it takes a long time for those balloons to come down. Um, and I've also seen it fall. 10, 12 meters per second, and it's it's going to be be here pretty soon at that rate. Um, it's it's around three hours, um, two and a half to three and a half hours, probably. Um, yes, sir. How long does the battery last in here after it hits the grass? That's a good question. I've read that it will keep going for about six hours. I've seen them keep going for more than seven hours. Beyond that, I don't know. Um, I, I do know that after 12 hours, they're usually not still transmitting. Um, so if you don't have a, a, a ground location on them before 12 hours, you may not, you, you may just have to go hunting for it. So if, lots of times, and, and especially now that it's, fall and moving towards winter, you're getting shorter time to go look for them before it's dark. So it's going to be dark almost for sure before you get to the balloon, but you can drive out to the location in the area and get a last reading of where, where it precisely fell. And then you can go back and pick it up in the daylight if it's someplace manageable. What type of weight are you looking at with the Parachute, radio sun, the line, everything. What'd you say, Bob? A couple of pounds? Yeah. No, not, no. Not even that. No. Yeah. It, a couple, a couple the, the, the balloon is probably the biggest weight. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, I've got a little parachute over there, and you can see it's pretty, pretty light. And there's the tail yeah, end of the but, balloon. But the, but the balloon's the most significant weight in, in the whole package. Yeah, you could, you could, you, yeah. you could. Unfortunately, the strings are usually tangled up in tree limbs or thorns or something. Um, so yeah, in the video that Rick had where where they were launching it, you could see there was a really long line on there. I read that they typically are seventy five feet. I don't know if that's your experience, Rick. But... I, I, what I've measured, I've measured anywhere between eighty and a hundred feet. Yeah. And um, the, I thought, well, that's dumb. You know, why don't they make it shorter? Well, they do that long distance because they don't want the heat that's collected by the balloon to affect the readings in the sensor package. Oh. Do you have another question? If a balloon, if balloon appears to be inflated, do not touch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've I've had that pointed out to me several times, but I've never seen one that appeared to be inflated. Yes, Ken. I have never seen anything uh, come from the one from from the, from the west. Yeah, um, there is a launch site up north. That, that is not a weather service launch site. It's a Department of Energy um, launch site. And can we ever find out what kind of energy you're looking for? No. It's it's called uh, atmospheric radiation monitoring. Why am I not?
Okay, so here's the the DOE side. It says it's the Sulphur Municipal Airport, but that's a lie. Yeah, I, I I think it I think it used to be. I think the DOE launch site used to be at Sulphur Municipal, but now it's up here. Um, the good thing, I mean, they launch. Seems like this site launches balloons two or three hours apart. Um, not every two or three hours, but when they launch a balloon, there'll be another one in two or three hours. So you 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 have the potential of getting more radio sons, but they all land up here. I mean, the furthest south that I've seen one land is um, wherever. Um, oh, there's a little town in here. Um, I don't remember the name of it. North of Guthrie, yeah. Mall Hall, yeah. Yeah, I, I've seen it as far south as Mall Hall, and I have picked up one of these. The nice thing about these radiosons is they also include a pressure sensor. Temperature, humidity, pressure, location, GPS, so. Not 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 the, not, not, not in the routine seen. ones. Yeah, I've I've got one other slide I wanted to hit, and then we are done. And it's really kind of a a challenge and it's something to think about. Rick, it's this one. Yeah, I I, I just have to um, get back to it. This summer there was a group in uh, New England that did a thing they call. Uh, HAB high altitude balloon, HAB GAB 2023. And uh, it's on the slide here. But what they did was they had a single 2000 gram weather balloon that they sent up. And attached to that was a crossband UHF VHF repeater that was supposed to last for two or three hours as this was going up. And think about that, you know, at the kind of altitude we're talking about with you know, 50, 100 mile radius on that, that was kind of a neat deal all by itself. They also had a uh, auto rotation copter that was released at 80,000 feet and used a light APRS tracker. Some of you know what, what those are. Those are about 100 to $130 that do some of the similar kind of stuff that we're talking about for free. <laughs> um, they also had a glider that was released at 80,000 feet, and they had two live camera feeds at 1.2 gigahertz, all hanging from this balloon, along with the main payload, which rode all the way up to where the balloon popped, and that was using a repurposed RS-41 like we've been talking about here on the 433, 432.501. The people that did that, it was a joint effort by a local ham radio club there in Massachusetts and a makers group there close by and several schools. So I just thought that was really a neat thing to try to tie schools and ham radio and maker fair kind of folks all together to do a joint effort. So that might be something we think about as a club project over the next year or two. So anyhow, give that some thought. The two questions is what time do they launch? Are they four days with other weather stations? Yeah, that's good. And address uh, when ask if there are different cutters for the icon. Uh, that means anything. I think I that one. Like the parish don't have different colors. Does that indicate anything? Not that we've been able to figure out. Not that I've been I think the, there are several different applications that that uh, we see here. We've been talking about Sand Hub, and my understanding is uh, not only do they change the color of the track, but they also change the type of icon, whether you're ascending or descending. So I think that's maybe the difference. That's, that's the color of the balloon. It's yes. Whether it's sending or descending or whether it's landing. Right, right. Some people fly far. 
So yeah. Yeah. So there's. Yeah. By the way, on the balloons, they do start out around six feet. You saw as they were launching in the video that that Rick had. I've read that uh, at altitude, it's that balloon expands out to the size of a two car garage. So you can see a big difference in pressure and big difference in size because of that. So you can put two cars in that balloon. <laughs> if you could fit them in there up at 22 oh, miles up. Yeah. And, and when you were talking about the Pico balloons earlier, you yeah. forgot to mention that sometimes they get shot down by, um, <laughs> by US Air Force Air jets. <laughs> Yeah. Ten dollar balloon with a half million dollar rocket. Yeah. But but it only took them two tries to knock it down. So yeah. Okay. Well, we thank you for your time today. Sorry we went a little bit long, but it uh, looks like there's some interest in this topic. So uh come see us at Elmer Knight and we'd be glad to talk further and get you going on on uh, your own project if you'd like. Well, let's thank Bob and Rick for a great program today. Thank you. You can catch them after the, the meeting or at, 